we come on the air tonight, the remnants of Hurricane Hillary right now are wrecking the West Coast, slamming roads, taking trees down. We're talking massive mudslides with concerns now about the wind moving north that could make the deadly wildfires in Washington state even worse. Plus, President Biden set to land in Hawaii really any second now. We're going to show it to you live after the devastating wildfires there. Why not everybody is happy he's making the trip. We're going to take you live to Maui. Plus, just into us, Bond is now set for former President Donald Trump in that Georgia election interference case. How much money he's agreeing to pay to stay out of jail? We're going to take you live to Fulton County with the latest. And in tonight's original, it's like Lyft or Uber, but without a driver, a car service that's popped up in California and now cutting its fleet in half after a pileup of controversies in a matter of days. What officials want to know now, later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are coming on the air tonight as Storm Hillary moves north and west after sending tons of rain cascading through streets in Nevada. That's right, that's a street right there with people in Southern California still reeling from this super rare storm in Palm Springs. Some people are stuck in their homes because of mud covering the streets. Look at this car, it's stuck. There are some people who say this stuff is kind of like quicksand. They just can't get out of it. There's also been big mudslides like these in the mountains, sending firefighters running for safety. Look at that. Rocks coming flying down. Eventually, they buried the roads on both sides of that fire station. Near L.A., look at this. Rescue crews pulling a car up and out of a flooding river, waterway, stream underneath that bridge. We don't even know how that car got there in the first place. Then you have Dodger Stadium looking like an island there, water surrounding it. It's parking lot just covered. And as Hillary heads north, it's also packing strong winds. That may be double trouble if those gusts whip up the wildfires, burning up some 25,000 acres in Washington state. Two people have been found dead in the area. Their exact cause of death is still being investigated. One official says what's happening now, it's not at all like the fires the state normally sees. Listen. We're not a stranger to wildfire, but what we see here is probably one of our most densely populated area being destroyed and impacted by wildfire. That is rare. The smoke from it all creating a problem, too. You can see here basically the entire state of Washington, plus parts of Idaho and Oregon under air quality alerts. We are also watching some unbelievable heat today in some places where it's so hot. You can see heat stroke or other heat illnesses. Ninety million people under those alerts. Jesse Kirsch is live for us in Washington. Guad Venegas is in San Diego. And we've also got meteorologist Bill Karens joining us. Guad, I want to get to you first. The wettest summer day San Diego has ever seen. Now Hillary has moved on, but people in Southern California and in the region are still dealing with what it left behind. Hallie, there was a lot of rain that came through yesterday here with the tropical storm coming into Southern California. So in San Diego, we knew from the beginning the risk from this storm was because of the possibility of these floods. Now, officials had identified the areas that were vulnerable to flooding. These are roads, these are neighborhoods, parts in the desert, parts in the mountains, where we know the flooding could take place. The storm also entered Southern California through the mountains. This is east of San Diego. So these these are the areas in those mountains as you move up north into San Bernardino and Riverside County where we've seen a lot of these dramatic videos where the rain came down. It created a lot of these mudslides and then uh, those rivers flowing uh, towards San Diego, towards Los Angeles, towards the ocean is where we've seen these images with that car in Los Angeles. We also had some rescues here in San Diego. But again, these were areas that officials had identified as vulnerable that residents were trying to keep away from. We also have areas in the desert. This is east of where the storm hit, like in Palm Springs, where we've had this flooding. This is flat land that doesn't absorb water well. Uh, here in San Diego, we got about two inches of rain downtown, but up in the mountains, it was a lot more than that. So right now, the storm has cleared from Southern California. You can see behind me, it's a beautiful day. And now authorities are waiting for the water, for the floods that continue coming down from the mountains to clear out as conditions have improved today, yeah. Allie. Yeah, and the cleanup's gonna take a while, right, Juan? 
It is, especially for the areas that flooded. So there's still an alert out there for communities that have some of that water clearing out. For example, here in San Diego, the San Diego River, which is getting a lot of the water that came from the mountains, is still flooded. So authorities are asking people to stay clear of that or others that live in neighborhoods that are very low. They have to wait for that water to clear, just like they have to do in Palm Springs and other areas. And it's only after the water has receded that authorities can then come and do the work that's necessary. We're going to hear from one of the residents in Palm Springs talking about what he's seeing right now. How long will it take to get it cleaned up and people can be on their way to work again and home? A lot of people are uh, kind of laughing this off and thinking that it's not a big deal, but it, it is. And uh, it's going to affect people for a long, long time. So for those residents who live in the mountains where the, the storm hit the hardest and the desert areas where they're seeing the flooding, of course, they're going to have more damage to the properties, to the roads around uh, their homes. And these are the ones that are going to have to work on the rebuilding. But the resources are there. There was an emergency declaration uh, by the state and also local communities, at least the county here in San Diego and in Los Angeles, declared a local emergency, which will make more resources available to respond once that water clears out, Hallie. Squad, Venegas, thank you very much. I want to get to Jesse Kirsch now, who is in Washington State, with more on those wildfires there. This is incident command for the Gray Fire. Of the three fires that are burning outside of Spokane, Washington, officials say that this fire has destroyed the largest number of structures and has threatened the largest number of residents here in eastern Washington state. Hundreds of firefighters have been working around the clock to battle this blaze, which has so far not been put under control. In Spokane County alone, there are reports of upwards of 25,000 acres burning. Thousands of people have been ordered to evacuate, including the city of Medical Lake, where roughly 5,000 people were ordered to evacuate. And we know that there have been dozens of structures, including homes, which have been burned down in these fires so far. The air quality has been a concern here and across much of Washington state because of the wildfires in Washington, as well as wildfires in Canada. All of this unfolding as we've learned from officials that there's one confirmed death, someone who was found in the gray fire zone, another person confirmed to have been found dead in the Oregon Road fire zone. However, at this point, officials have not confirmed whether or not those deaths have been caused by the fire. So we'll be watching for an update there amid this devastation as firefighters again continue working to battle these blazes. Back to you. Our thanks to Jesse Kirsch for that reporting. I want to get to our NBC News meteorologist, Bill Carrots, who is tracking all of it, not just where Storm Hillary is headed next, but what's up with these wildfires, any relief in sight in Washington State and the Pacific Northwest, and then these heat alerts too, Bill. It's a lot tonight. Yeah, there's a lot going on, and even some things that I'm scratching my head with, trying to figure out if it's accurate or not. So with what we know with the heat right now, this is one of the hottest heat domes we've ever recorded in the middle of the country. Areas like Topeka and Springfield, Missouri, they release weather balloons in the sky that measure the temperatures. It's kind of the hottest it's ever really been. So it's not surprising we're getting these crazy numbers. So the heat index is taken in the shade com combination. It's an equation that goes with the temperature and the dew point, the amount of moisture in the air. And right now it feels like 119 in Kansas City. Now there's a phenomenon called corn sweat. This time of year when you get the corn crops, if you're out in the fields, it sweats, they hold a lot of moisture. So the dew point's even higher than it would be, say, in a city or somewhere else. And we have these wild numbers popping up here in the Corn Belt areas here in Iowa, in western Iowa. Dennis at 143, Harlan's 125, Atlantic's 150, Creston is 133. Usually when you have like one number that's this high, you're like, okay, the sensor's broken, we can kind of ignore it. But we have numerous areas here. I know there's a 137 being reported in Kansas City in Kansas right now. So uh, it's possible. And we got a 125. One, Sioux City's at 121. So regardless, it is very dangerous to be out there in the heat in the middle of the country right now, especially if you're at any of those near the cornfields. Other things we're watching, this tropical wave in the Gulf of Mexico. Franklin, we're going to have to watch this storm in the next couple days, heading for Dominican Republic and also a little bit of Puerto Rico. But don't be surprised tomorrow morning you wake up and hear a headline saying tropical storm Harold has made landfall in South Texas because that's mm. what the hurricane center is predicting it'll be somewhere here just north of brownsville thankfully hallie not enough time for this storm to get strong it'll bring some beneficial yeah. rain hopefully not too many tornadoes and severe weather i just have to go 
a heat index of 150, Bill, 140, 130. I mean, that is like almost yeah. literally off the charts, right? I don't even think that that's like tracked. <laughs> Yeah, the chart that I have goes up to 135. And I've heard of corn sweat before and looked into it, and I know it can give you these crazy numbers, and it's in isolated areas. I'll try to confirm. We're trying to figure out if it's real or not, right. but regardless, it's extremely hot throughout all of that region. Yeah, no kidding. Bill Karens, thank you very much. A lot on your plate tonight. I know. Appreciate it. Also, of course, a lot going on in Hawaii. President and the First Lady are set to land literally any minute. We've actually got our teams of... Camera folks, photographers, journalists covering every second of this. He's going to be meeting with people on Maui, touring the absolute devastation after the town of Lahaina was incinerated. You can see where the president is set to speak. He's got to land. He's got to get there. So we're still a few minutes away from that. But you are seeing that live look right now. The latest numbers show that at least 850 people are believed to be missing. At least 114 people have been confirmed dead. And officials say it could take weeks to finish the search of that huge burn zone, FEMA, now warning its disaster fund could run dry soon. I want to bring in Dana Griffin, who is on the ground for us on Maui now. Dana, this is a significant moment for President Biden. It is significant because it takes the presidential spotlight and shines it on this island that has been just ripped apart by these wildfires. Not everybody is celebrating President yeah. Biden's visit here, right? Explain that. Yeah, some people say that they feel it's a little too late. You know, this disaster ha happened nearly two weeks ago. And some people probably wanted to see the president here on the island sooner and addressing the fire a lot sooner. But the president has said that he did not want to distract or take away from the search and rescue, which has been the priority right now. As you mentioned, 850 people still unaccounted for. We're told also by officials, including the governor, that unfortunately, many of those victims will never be found because the fire burned so hot, it's turned remains into ashes, burning hotter than an incinerator. We've heard from people who are hoping to hear from the president that there is a plan in place for the next few years to come, because this is not just a, a few week type you know, disaster. This is a disaster that will take years, if not decades, to rebuild for the people of Lahaina. So many people want to know, how will they get long-term housing? Yeah. How will they be able to afford to take care of themselves? Tourism has also been impacted here on the island. What's the plan to make sure that the economy doesn't tank? And listen to what some other residents have said in light of the president's visit. I just would encourage the president to come meet us, see us, see the pain, see the, the grief, feel it, embrace it. And we are told the president will be meeting with survivors, first responders, and some of the officials here. And hopefully he'll get a better sense of what the needs are here in Lahaina and on Maui. Hallie. Dana, as you've been talking, we have seen Air Force One land there on Maui. You can see Marine One now as the president. Obviously, the plane is coming in for the, for the taxi. The president will get off along with the first lady, get on that helicopter, and then head to Lahaina. He will obviously get a sense aerially from the sky of what this looks like as you can see that shot pulling back, and we expect to see the plane pulling up any second here, Dana. It comes as there's been some criticism of FEMA as well, questions about whether that federal agency did enough soon enough, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people on Maui were very frustrated in the very few days when this when this fire tore through the town of Lahaina. Many were concerned that enough resources weren't getting to West Maui, where we currently are, because they closed down the main road here and weren't allowing people to go back and forth to check on their families, their homes, their pets. That road has since reopened, and we haven't heard as much criticism to that because a lot of people have gotten the resources that they need. Um, but there's still a lot more that the people of Maui are going to need in the coming weeks and years. Uh, so we're hoping to get a better sense of what this relief has been like for people. We know some 1,800 people that have been displaced are now in hotels, but many of, the, of them now need permanent housing. Uh, so that's a major concern for people here on Maui. And we've even heard from the FEMA administrator, Deanne Criswell, that the FEMA fund could soon run out. They're projecting in September because it's been fueled by these back-to-back -back natural disasters that have cost the country so much money. They say they are working on a plan to try to postpone some projects to try to keep that fund afloat, but that is definitely a major concern when you've got people here saying, hey, the $700 that you've deposited into our accounts is not going to be enough.
Dana Griffin, live for us there on Maui. Dana, thank you. As we are seeing, of course, Air Force One taxiing in there ahead of President Biden's remarks in the town of Lahaina, that historic town that has been just devastated by those wildfires on the island. We're going to bring you live coverage of the president's visit throughout the evening here on NBC News Now. We'll get back to this story. We're keeping an eye on it as warranted. We've also got to tell you about some other developing news that's happening late tonight, because in just the last hour, we've learned just how much it's going to take to keep former President Trump out of jail on bond. With our team watching his attorneys leave in court late today in Fulton County, Georgia. That bond... $200,000, with the district attorney herself signing off on it. And there are some conditions that come with it. Specifically, no threats against witnesses, co-defendants, victims, or the Fulton County community and property. That includes anything, by the way, that former President Trump posts or reposts on social media. NBC's Blaine Alexander is joining us now from Atlanta. That list of conditions is so interesting, Blaine, because the other co-defendants that we've seen come to these bond agreements so far, they don't face yeah. the same thing, right? Like, this is very specific to Donald Trump himself. Tell us more. That is absolutely specific to Donald Trump himself. And that was something that caught our eyes immediately when we looked at that. Throughout the day, we've kind of been seeing a flurry, I guess you could say, or several of those consent bonds kind of hitting the docket one by one. But certainly, it was the one for Donald Trump. And notably, that one became public maybe within 20 to 30 minutes of his attorneys walking out of the courthouse. I stopped them and I asked them, hey, did you come to an agreement with the DA's office? And the lead attorney, Andrew Finling, told me, quote, you'll find out shortly, less than a half hour hour later, we saw that consent bond. So mm -hmm. that is what we found out. Those are the agreements. But yes, that's something that is only on Donald Trump's. The other thing that's only on his is it was signed specifically by Fonnie Willis. The other ones were signed by representatives from her office, a representative from her office. But this is one that she signed personally, which is certainly interesting as well. So while we've been on surrender watch down at the Fulton County Jail, what we've been watching here at the courthouse is a lot of just kind of coming and goings of legal representation. We saw, of course, the attorneys uh, for Ken Cheesebro come in and out and then come in and out again. We know that they were meeting with the DA's team to negotiate his terms of surrender and certainly seeing from the former president's attorneys as well. So a lot of movement, and I think that that's what we can suspect to see in the coming days as yeah. we watch and see people turning themselves in down at the jail, Hallie. And to be clear, Blaine, just because I think there's not a lot of folks who are as steeped in this as you and your team are, this is not the surrender. In other words, there is still the expectation that later this no. week, Donald Trump will in some form have to show up at the jail to essentially turn himself in on the charges he faces. And then separately, he'll have to be arraigned. Still a question mark on whether he has to appear for that or not. But in other words, this $200,000 bond thing, this is just like the... I hate to use this, like almost an appetizer course to a couple of other main events coming up in the couple, next couple of weeks. That's a great point, Hallie. This is not the surrender. He has not turned himself in yet, to be very clear. He's not turned himself in yet. Uh, he's not turned himself in down to the Fulton County Jail. And at last check, none of the 19 co-defendants have turned themselves in. What this does is essentially this sets the terms of bond. So really, it, 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 theoretically, it should make it so that they're in the building for a shorter amount of time because all of the processes have already been worked out. They've already come to agreement on how things look. They don't have to do that once he actually gets booked in. So it's just a matter of going down, doing whatever needs to be done to process, and then getting out because this is already in place, Hallie. Blaine Alexander live for us there in Atlanta. Blaine, good to see you. Thank you. So that is the legal landscape for former President Trump. But tonight we're getting a new look at the political landscape in the key state of Iowa. And in just the last hour, some of the newest numbers show a big divide over Republicans there about whether Mr. Trump should remain the leader of their party. Still, for now, in that state, he is stomping his competition. Look at this, by 23 points. We haven't seen a lead like this since the year 2000 in Iowa. When George W. Bush led the first poll there by nearly 30 points, he went on to win. But dig a little bit deeper, and the numbers out late tonight show about half of Iowa Republicans say the party needs a new leader, though they're divided on why they feel that's the case. Some thinks, you know, he was a good president, but we need others. Some feel a little bit differently. All that said, though, these new numbers from our NBC News Des Moines polling probably only reinforced Donald Trump's decision to skip out on Wednesday night's debate and maybe some future ones, too. He said over on Truth Social he's not going to be doing the debates, plural. Doesn't mean he wants the other candidates to take the spotlight, of course. With NBC News confirming tonight, he has already taped an interview with Tucker Carlson. As rumors fly, that Carlson will try to put that out somewhere to try to counter-program Wednesday's debate. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is covering all of it from Des Moines. And what's interesting about this poll... 
lot, if you're Donald Trump, you feel good about what is in this poll, right? Not just beating his competition, but beating them to a level that we haven't seen in a couple of decades here. Talk through what you're hearing behind the scenes and from voters in Iowa. Holly, you're absolutely right. On one hand, these numbers, if you're Donald Trump and his campaign, they make you feel really good, especially when you look at the number of folks that say they're firmly behind his camp and they've made up their mind. Of those who said Donald Trump was their first choice, uh, about two-thirds of them said that they are firm in their decision that Donald Trump is their guy on January 15th. Compare that to Ron DeSantis. Just one-third of his folks say they are firmly in his camp here. And so that 23-point advantage for Donald Trump from that end, it looks pretty good. But at the same time, you can also look at this Iowa poll from all of the other candidates' vantage points and say there is, perhaps for the first time, a true opening here in the state of Iowa because Donald Trump is far and away from more than 50 percent of the vote here. And when you're looking at uh, the number of Iowa Republicans who are actively considering somebody else, you've you got to feel good if you're Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, even the likes of Chris Christie and Ron DeSantis here, because there is an indicator from Republicans that they are open-minded, and this may not be a sure bet. Right now, the rest of the field, they're diluting that vote alternative to Trump, but there could be an open field in the next five months. You know, one of the things we talked about less than four minutes ago, Vaughn, with our colleague Blaine Alexander, was one of the indictments facing former President Trump, one of four indictments that he is now facing. We have seen him and his team uh, seek to campaign off that, right? I mean, they've raised a lot of money off of these indictments right. by framing it as a political persecution against the former president. Is there a limit, based on some of the new polling that we're seeing, to how far he can basically take that as a campaign issue? Right. Largely, Donald Trump has remained defensive. And, you know, two thirds of Iowa Republicans do not believe that Donald Trump has uh, has committed serious crimes. And so largely the Iowa Republican electorate, they're sympathetic to Donald Trump. Take a listen to part of the conversation we had with a few folks about the future of the Republican Party. Hallie. Do you believe the future of the Republican Party is being held up by Donald Trump? I think it's being destroyed by Donald Trump. I'll vote for any Republican that gets on the ticket other than Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis. Yes. Tim Scott. Yes. Any of them. Hallie, one third of Iowa Republicans are like Jody and Dennis saying they want to move on from Donald Trump and believe that he has uh, committed serious crimes here. The question is, can any of these other Republican candidates convince the other two thirds that they should move away from Donald Trump and give them a shot to be their party's nominee in 2024. Well, they've got four plus months to try to figure that out. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much. Live for us tonight in Iowa. Appreciate it. Let's take you live to Tennessee now, where state lawmakers, as we speak right now, are starting a special session called by the Republican governor to look at public safety after that terrible school shooting at a Nashville elementary school in March. It left six people dead, including three little kids and two of the governor's friends. Since the shooting, you've seen groups in that state and around the country demonstrating, asking the governor and lawmakers to do something. It's all happening as a new analysis out tonight of CDC data shows that gun-related injuries, things having to do with guns, are the leading cause of death for kids and teens for the second year in a row. Not car crashes, not overdoses, not cancer, it's guns. Guns killed more than 4,700 kids in 2021. That is a grim record. The majority of those deaths, about two-thirds, were homicides. Berkeley Loveless is joining us now. Um, Berkeley, what explains this? What does the study say about the reasons behind this? Yeah, so this actually surprised the researchers. So they actually thought that gun sales or gun deaths would actually go down in 2021, not up. Um, and so during the pandemic, kids were at home, and so gun deaths rose sharply. Um, and the thinking was that gun deaths would actually go down the following year uh, as more people were going outside. Um, and so that didn't happen. And so they're currently blaming social or structural inequity, racism, social determinants of health, uh, food insecurity. Uh, gun sales also went up during that time. Um, and so right now they're ab advocating for stricter gun laws and also for parents to store their guns in safer places in the house. You mentioned race. Race does have an impact in these numbers here. Walk us through that. Yeah, so uh, black children were more likely to die by homicides. In fact, two-thirds of black 
male children were dying by homicides, um, and then white children are more likely to die from self-inflicted gun injuries. Um, and so kids who also survive these things also have other things that they may have to deal with, such as mental health problems and substance abuse disorders. So this is to say that this is also like a public health issue as well as a, as well as a political one. Does this new analysis wade into potential solutions here, things that we can do? Uh, it does not. Yeah. Um, currently, it's just they're kind of going through the surprise. Um, I actually spoke with somebody. Uh, her name is uh, Dr. E uh, Emily Lieberman. She was the survivor of the Highland Park shooting. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's currently advocating uh, for more mental health services as well as stricter gun laws as well. Um, and she's still cur currently seeing um, many children dying from gun. gun. Yeah, guns yeah. in this country. Yeah. Berkeley Levels, thank you very much thank for bringing you. us these new numbers uh, and what they mean. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, including a mass shooting at a hookah lounge in Seattle, killing at least three people. What officials say they found on scene. Plus, more cases of that deadly flesh-eating bacteria we've been telling you about, where it is and what to do about it, coming up. Let's take it to Southern California now, where we're learning more about the death of a clothing store owner shot and killed outside her store over a pride flag hanging at her boutique. Police say Lori Carlton was pronounced dead on the scene. The suspect initially ran away and was later shot and killed by police after a confrontation. You can see all the flowers that people have placed at the entrance to the store. Carlton was a mother of nine, described as a pillar in her community. One of her daughters, calling her death a senseless act of violence, she says her mom's flag had been torn down before and she always responded by putting up a bigger one. You can see the quotes here. A lot of celebrities, Jamie Lee Curtis, Kristen Davis, have been posting their support and calling for Carlton to be remembered as a hero. I want to bring in Maggie Vespa now, who's covering more on this story. What else do we know about the details here, what happened and, and where this goes? Yeah, so basically, Hallie, this happened on Friday. We just spoke to another store owner who told us that she has a shop basically down the block. She didn't hear an argument. She didn't hear the gunshots, but she said neighboring store owners had seen a guy kind of peering into store windows, basically freaking people out a little bit earlier in the day and then ducking between cars. Authorities say, and this is the person who neighbors believe was um, in the neighborhood earlier, that a suspect was upset about the pride flag and moments after getting into a confrontation uh, with Carlton about that flag, shot her inside her store, which is called Magpie. It's in uh, this area of San Bernardino, just kind of a small mountain town. And she was, make no mistake, a renowned fashion designer for the stars, as well as this store owner. We're seeing a lot of tributes that you just named pouring in from celebrities, including from famed director Paul Feig. He directed, among other big movies, uh, Bridesmaids, and he said that she was a close friend of his. And he also wrote, I want to get this right here, he said, quote, this intolerance has to end. Anyone using hateful language against the LGBTQ plus community has to realize their words matter. So a lot of pain here, Hallie. I should note the suspect yeah. in this case has yet to be named. We are waiting on that here today. But the backdrop and the context is important, too, as you pull out to the macro, Maggie, because this comes as there has yeah. been a spike in anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric, right? It has. And that, again, played, obviously, a key role in this case. We're waiting to hear from police who, and I'll note, deputies later shot and killed the suspect. That's an important detail here. So we don't have this person who we can talk to and find out any more about why this played out. But absolutely, hate is mounting against the LGBTQ plus community. No one knows that better than the president of GLAAD, Sarah Kate Ellis. Take a listen to what she said earlier. A symbol like a flag that is for us supposed to be love and acceptance has been weaponized and has been turned into something that now someone loses their life over. It's horrible. Yeah, and she says that knowing the people in the community Name Carlton as an ally. You know, she was a straight woman, essentially, who had a pride flag in front of her store because she was an ally to the community. But again, the numbers are really jarring. In fact, we found one study that shows 145 attacks against the LGBTQ community in the U.S. this year. That's three times the rate of last year, Hallie. Maggie Vespa, uh, important reporting. Thank you very much for bringing us this story. I appreciate it. Florida health officials are out with a warning tonight after five people died because of a rare flesh-eating bacterial infection in the Tampa Bay area. Another 21 people have gotten sick from this bacteria since the start of the year. It happens, this bacteria, very, like, naturally. You can get it if you swim in what they call brackish water. So that's, like, warmer water. It's where fresh water meets salt water. So think 
bays, think sounds, for example. This bacteria gets in through like an open cut or an open wound. You can also get it from eating bad shellfish. It is deadly in about one in every five people who get it. Now, Floridians are used to seeing at least some cases in the summer, but the group of deaths now in such a short period of time is what has these local health officials so worried. If this sounds a little familiar, we reported here on this show just last week that three people died in the New York area from getting sick from the same kind of bacteria. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. Is this, put this into context, right? Um, we know that this bacteria is out there in the summer. This happens. How concerned should we be about the number of deaths in this short period of time? I think that officials are going to be following this trend really carefully, Hallie. I mean, we're, what are we now, like eight months into the year, and we've already surpassed some of the past year's totals. You know, really, I hate to say it, but there's two words, climate change. We see mm. that warmer temperatures allow bacteria to flourish. Um, and there's also, if you take a look at 2022, there were 74 cases and 17 deaths. Why? Well, climate change, uh, you know, triggering all these hurricanes. And we know that in a hurricane situation, again, with standing water. That's one of the consequences and the fallout of such a natural disaster, Hallie. What about if you live near like a bay or a sound or these, you know, brackish, as they call them, areas of water? What do you need to do? Not eat? Like, would you say to your patients, don't eat shellfish, don't go swimming? Or is that too far? You know, I... I yeah, look, I mean, I, I people aren't going to stop eating, you know, raw fish, unfortunately, but raw or undercooked fish that are contaminated, that shellfish, that is definitely a risk factor. Obviously, if you are, you know, in brackish or salt water with an open wound or you recently had surgery, a piercing tattoo, you're putting yourself at risk. You also definitely want to wash your hands very, very carefully after handling raw food. The symptoms of something like this, Hallie, typically a, a skin infection after about 24 hours after exposure, but you can get sick really quickly. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramping can very quickly lead to fevers, chills, and even sepsis. As you mentioned, one in five people die from this. So it happens really, really quickly. Quickly, The CDC health officials want people to be aware of this. Um, and again, we'll see by the end of the year if we've really surpassed uh, you know, past year's averages. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. Definitely one to watch. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, officials say three people have been killed, six others hurt after a shooting at a hookah lounge in Seattle. Police say they found five guns at the scene, but they haven't released any other information yet about the potential suspects. It's still under investigation. Number two, a federal judge in Georgia is temporarily blocking part of a state law that stops or restricts doctors from prescribing hormone therapy to transgender minors. The judge says the harm trans people could face from the ban, like depression, anxiety, self-harm, outweighs any harm to the state. But the part of the law that bans gender transition surgery for minors is going to stay in place. The judge says her ruling will stay in effect until a further court order or trial. Number three, Domino's is going to close all of its stores in Russia. And the company that owns the franchise rights for the brand says it'll file for bankruptcy. This is the third biggest pizza delivery business in Russia. They've got like 140 stores there. McDonald's and Starbucks already left the country more than a year ago after its invasion of Ukraine. Number four, Sunday, National Cinema Day. Tickets for all movies, anytime, any format, will be under $4 at something like 3,000 participating theaters. Number five, Meta says it'll launch the web version of its Threads app soon. That's after Threads saw a monster drop in users. Remember all the excitement? Everybody was like, Threads, it's taken over the world. Well, ugh, didn't really sustain that energy. Thre Threads, which is like part of the you know, meta Insta family is trying to beat out X, formerly known as Twitter. According to the Wall Street Journal, the web desktop laptop launch could happen as soon as this week. When we come back, the nurse at the center of a case that has gripped the UK, getting a rare sentence today, how victims' families are reacting. Plus, a scary new report on the number of close calls at airports that may surprise you. What the FAA is saying, coming up. At least three people have died after drinking something pretty popular at a restaurant over in Washington state. We'll tell you what officials are blaming coming up in just a second. But first tonight, new reporting that there are way more close calls at airports around the country than we thought, according to a New York Times review of some initial safety reports by the FAA. The paper found 46 close calls on runways in just the last month. We know about some of them. Remember this? 
This is a screen grab from inside the cockpit of a JetBlue plane that came within seconds of hitting a chartered plane that was taking off, didn't have permission, over at Boston Logan. Then there was this moment at New York City's JFK. You can see it here, right? This American Airlines flight forcing a Delta jet to abandon its takeoff. They somehow crossed the same runway. In Boston, two planes actually clipped wings on the tarmac. Oof, remember that moment? I know Tom Casella does. He covered all of them. He is joining us now. So listen, the FAA says, hey, listen, most of these incidents are minor, but there are more of them, right? Yeah. Why are they happening so much more often? And what is the FAA going to do about it? I think there's a number of reasons, but let's be clear. These are called runway incursions. In other words, you have a close call on a runway. Yeah. But they are grouped differently. You got category A, B, C, D. Why does that matter? Because if you count all of them together, then it does seem like we've had a real rash of them. But if you break them down into the most serious categories, Less so. But nonetheless, the uh, New York Times did go ahead and categorize all 46 in July as more serious. Doesn't much matter, but here's a couple of reasons maybe why this is happening. And by the way, I've talked to the Air, Air Traffic yeah. Controllers Union, the pilots, the FAA. Everybody agrees there's an issue here. Number one, staffing uh, now with less experienced crews because, of course, we've had a rash of new hires for pilots in the last couple of years post-pandemic. And then you've had the rise in post-pandemic air travel. In other words, there are far more passengers today. The skies are packed with planes right now. And is there some complacency after a period of no fatalities? We have not had a U.S. airliner go down and crash with fatalities in this country in about 14 years. Thank God. Yes. Nobody wants that. But uh, have we now had some complacency sleep in, seep in, in the tower and in the cockpit? That's the concern right now. So if I am a passenger, right, and I'm not an aviation correspondent, transportation correspondent like you, and I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, okay, I get it. Tom Costello is telling me that 46 close calls on the runway in the last month, not all of them were serious, fine. Still doesn't feel good. It doesn't make you doesn't feel, feel good, good from it. Like just an right. optical, you know, whatever, optic perspective sure. even. Like how much is the FAA grappling with that piece of it? Just serious. passenger vibes. They're basically. taking it very seriously. Uh, the NTSB is very serious about it. Uh, and the, air, the unions are very serious. Now, we know that the FAA earlier this year called this safety summit, you may recall, right? Essentially, it wasn't a ground stop, but it was a safety, not a standstill or stand down. But with these incidents you see listed on your maps, this has got the FAA's attention, the air traffic controllers union's attention, the airline's attention. All of them have said for the last few months, we are doubling down on mm -hmm. safety, drilling down. And among the issues, Hallie Jackson, is this. There has has to be a sterile cockpit. Now, if you're a pilot, exactly. you know what that is. Essentially, it means when you are sitting in the cockpit, you don't talk about the football game this weekend. You don't uh, talk about the kids. You talk about the job until you're at 10,000 feet. You don't take the conversation off the job until you're at 10,000 feet cruising altitude. They're drilling down on that. Get back to the basics in the cockpit and in the tower. It's like our newsroom. We don't talk about anything other than the news. I don't know who you're 5 talking to. 5 to 7 p.m. That's it. <laughs> Tom Costello, thank you. We're going to look for more on your reporting. Can anyone up tonight on Nightly News at 630 Eastern with Lester Holt. You can find it wherever you watch your local NBC station. Tom, thank you. You bet. Lots more coming up here on the show, including Maryland reporting its first case of malaria and somebody who hasn't been outside the country in like 40 years. What we know about the recovery. A former neonatal nurse sentenced to life prison in the U.K. today. We told you about this Stunning case last week. Lucy Lepi, convicted of killing seven babies and trying to kill six others that she was supposed to be taken care of. Here's what the judge said at her sentencing. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. During the course of this trial, you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have no remorse. We also heard from family members in court making statements off camera for their privacy. One mother whose child was killed telling Lepi, and I'm quoting here, there is no sentence that will ever compare to the excruciating agony that we've suffered as a consequence of your actions. Josh Letterman is joining us now. It is such a horrific story, Josh. And this life sentence is rare in the UK, right? 
it is rare, but it is also the harshest penalty that was available to them in this case, Hallie, because remember, the UK doesn't have the death penalty like we have in the States. The most they can do is ensure that someone like Lucy Letby, who's 33 years old, will die in prison. And in fact, they have provisions for early release the way we would have uh, probation or other types of release in the U.S., but the judge in this case specifically ordering uh, that she not be eligible for that early release any time in her life, saying there were no mitigating factors to enter into the record here. And also, her own attorney, uh, in fact, did not put out much of a fight to, to that, saying there was no mitigating factors that they could present uh, either. And so she will end up dying in prison. But during this sentencing, we heard from a lot of these parents saying that they have essentially been re-traumatized by this entire ordeal, this 10-month trial. Uh, the father of two twins who are referred to as child O and child P uh, to protect their identity, he said that he found that Lucy Lepi was staring at him in the courtroom uh, during parts of this trial. He had to move seats. He said, it has destroyed our lives. This father saying that it has destroyed me as a man, as a father, even after the trial has ended, he says, it will continue to haunt us and will always have an impact on our lives. Now, the last time that Lucy Lepi was actually in court was on August 17th. And after that, she told her lawyers she didn't want to be in court anymore. And that has been attracting a whole lot of attention uh, today, Hallie, because while the life sentence was not totally unsurprising, given the severity of this case, what shocked so many people uh, was the fact that she decided to skip her own sentencing. She said she didn't want to be there. She didn't want to uh, look in the faces of anyone as she was being given this sentence. Uh, and that is prompting some real blowback here in the UK about why it is uh, that suspects, in this case, convicted uh, criminals, are allowed to not be present. We heard from Rishi Sunak, the prime minister, as he was actually visiting a nursery today in the northern part of England, uh, and he reacted to the fact that she did not attend her own sentencing. Take a listen. I think it's cowardly that people who commit such horrendous crimes uh, do not face their victims and hear firsthand the impact that their crimes have had on them and their families and loved ones. And so now this is prompting a real call for that to change. We heard today from Rishi Sunak's spokesman saying he supports changing the law to require uh, these people to be in court for their sentencing. The mm. opposition leader, Keir Starmer, has said that he, too, if elected, would change the law. So this may prompt some changes in the way the U.K. handles these criminal cases, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you for that reporting there live for us from London. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it'd be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Midwest Bureau, the Ohio teenager, nicknamed Hell on Wheels, convicted of intentionally crashing a car at 100 miles an hour, has been sentenced to 15 years to life today. That car crash killed her boyfriend and friend. The two sentences will be served at the same time. She'll also have her driver's license permanently suspended. Out of our Western Bureau, officials say three people have been killed, six hospitalized after a listeria outbreak at a fast food spot in Washington state. Investigators found this bacteria in all the flavors of milkshakes, saying the ice cream machines there hadn't been cleaned right. Um, you can see the chain here. It's like local to the state of Washington. Officials don't think any of the other locations were affected. And out of our Eastern Bureau, a rare case of locally acquired malaria in the D.C. area. Officials say the patient has not been outside the U.S. recently. They were hospitalized but are now recovering. It's been a really long time since Maryland has seen any kinds of cases like these. There have been seven in Florida, one in Texas since May. Still to come, some pretty surprising new video out of the Women's World Cup and the apology from the president of Spain's Women's Soccer Federation. We'll have that in just a second. Plus, these kinds of cars driving a big debate in San Francisco. Videos going viral, raising questions about their safety. We'll tell you the context check that you should know about coming up. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we're taking it to San Francisco where a fully driverless taxi service called Cruise just agreed to slice its fleet in half while officials investigate a whole bunch of crashes and some pretty strange behavior. 
from these driverless cars. It is a big reversal from just a couple weeks ago when regular regulators there gave Cruz and another company, Waymo, the green light to run these robo-taxis basically all over San Francisco. But some things happened and some people in the area not so thrilled to see it. Still, with car crashes killing something like 43,000 people across the country last year. By the way, cars with human drivers. These companies say they're actually just trying to make the roads safer. So what's up with all this? NBC's Dave Ingram has the story. There's like 10 of them right now. You've probably seen them on social media. Videos going viral of driverless taxis in San Francisco causing traffic jams. This is where our country's come to. <laughs> and as the frustrations grow, the oversight seems to be on its own jerky ride. Just a week and a half ago, California regulators voted to allow two companies, Waymo and Cruise, to start offering 24-7 autonomous taxi service. But over the weekend, California's DMV demanded that Cruise cut its operating fleet in half while they investigate recent crashes. Walking down the streets of San Francisco, you almost can't miss these driverless robo taxis. And even though the city by the bay is a famously tolerant place, these newcomers are getting a pretty wide range of reactions. I think it, the technology is amazing. It feels like we were, we're living with the Jetsons. <laughs> I think it's not safe, despite them saying it is safe. I think it's going just one step too far. Look at this Driving the debate, regular snafus. There's like one, two, three, four cruise cars blocking. No one can get through. Just one day after California approved the expanded use of driverless cars, nearly a dozen robo-taxis froze, creating a traffic jam. And I looked and there were no drivers in them. Then a New York Times report of one getting stuck in wet cement. Look at these guys. And separately, a cruise taxi collided with a fire truck last week, preventing it from responding to a fire, according to NBC Bay Area. San Francisco's fire chief previously telling NBC News the company's helpline just doesn't cut it in an emergency situation. Like, we don't have time to call a 1-800 number when we are trying to get to an incident to do our job. It's impacting public safety, and my concern is that it's going to have dire consequences at some point. Those concerns have prompted activists to fight back, using traffic cones to confuse the vehicle's sensors. Cruz is pushing back on safety criticisms, saying, quote, Cruz's safety record is strong and we're proud of it. More than three million driverless miles in San Francisco without a single fatality or life-threatening injury. They added that they continue to make improvements. Waymo, the other self-driving taxi company owned by Google's Alphabet, did not respond to our request for comment, but has also defended its safety record. Across the whole country last year, there were 1.35 deaths per 100 million miles driven by humans, according to the federal government. The robo-taxis here still still have a lot of driving to do just to make a fair comparison. I've been in several myself as a resident of the area. The rides got me from point A to point B every time and were relatively uneventful, which isn't always the case. Reports that some people are having sex in the robo-taxis with no driver around to stop them, adding to the intrigue for locals in the city. It's cheaper than a hotel room, but a little cramped. You know, we're very inventive when it comes to illegal sexual activity in this town. Oh, Dave Ingram is joining us now. So listen, you know, I think some of those stats towards the end were really interesting here about the idea of crashes. Those are obviously the most important incidents because that's when people are either at risk or not. Talk about when robo taxis are at fault versus human drivers, right? Because that's a thread to pull on here, too. Yeah, that's that's really one of the most surprising things about this story, that um, of the more than 600 collisions that have been reported to the California DMV, um, Reviews by NBC News and others have shown that the vast majority of cases, uh, the fault lies with the human driver that's in another vehicle, not with the autonomous vehicle. So uh, not only are these vehicles causing, um, not only are humans causing collisions with these other vehicles, but then, of course, every day, 100 people or so um, are being killed on streets across America. And there have been some high-profile cases here in San Francisco that have been giving ammunition yeah. uh, to these tech companies. Dave Ingram, great reporting. Thank you for bringing it to us here on the show. Appreciate it. As we come on the air tonight, the remnants of Hurricane Hillary right now wrecking the West Coast. You've seen roads slammed, trees down, huge mudslides, with concerns now about the wind moving north. That could make the deadly wildfires in Washington, Washington State 
even worse. We've got live coverage up and down the coast. Plus, President Biden set to speak on Maui any minute now after the devastating wildfires there. We've got live coverage watching every move and why not everybody is happy he's making the trip. Plus, just into us, Bond is now set for former President Donald Trump in that Georgia election interference case. How much money he's agreeing to pay to stay out of jail. We're going to take you live to Georgia with the latest. We'll also take you to Tennessee, where right now lawmakers are starting a new special session about gun violence. As chilling new numbers are just in from the CDC, showing guns are now the leading cause of death for kids in this country. Plus, what's in the water? New warnings out of Florida tonight about a rare flesh-eating bacteria that has killed at least five people. What well, you should know later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air tonight as Storm Hillary moves north and west after sending heavy rain cascading through streets in Nevada. Look at this. People in Southern California are still reeling from this super rare storm. We're just getting in some pictures here. Look at this. A cargo train that reportedly derailed in Palm Springs because the tracks were covered in mud. Look how muddy it is. You can see it there. Again, this is just in the last couple of minutes. We're working on getting more info. There's also this, right? People stuck in their homes because... Their cars are stuck in what's been described as kind of like quicksand. It's just sucking their tires in. Same thing happened here. Look at the semi-truck. It is half submerged in mud on the side of the highway. That is in deep. You're seeing mudslides in the mountains. Look at this one. Firefighters running for safety with rocks coming flying down. Eventually, this buried both sides of the road on either side of the station. Near L.A., you've got rescue crews pulling this car up and out of that, that river or that stream underneath the bridge. We don't know how that car even got there in the first place. Dodger Stadium, there it is, kind of an island with water covering the parking lot, surrounding it on all sides. And as Hillary heads north, it's also packing strong winds. That may be double trouble if those gusts whip up the wildfires, burning up some 25,000 acres in Washington state. Two people have been found dead in the area, their exact cause of death still being investigated. And one official says what's happening now is not at all like the fires the state normally sees. Watch. We're not a stranger to wildfire, but what we see here is probably one of our most densely populated area being destroyed and impacted by wildfire. That is rare. The smoke from it all is creating a problem, too. You can see here basically the entire state of Washington, plus parts of Idaho and Oregon, under air quality alerts. In the Midwest, it is not the smoke. It is the heat that is making it difficult for so many. It is at dangerous levels at this point. Jesse Kirsch is in Washington State for us. Guad Venegas is live in San Diego. And meteorologist Bill Cairns is joining us with a look at where Hillary goes next or at least its remnants. But, Guad, we want to start with you here. What it's like on the ground and some of these new images coming in. It seems like in some parts of the region, it's that wet and sticky mud that is creating so many problems. It is, Hallie. The weather here in San Diego has cleared up. We had rain all of yesterday. So we know that this tropical storm crossed the border from northern Mexico into the U.S. east of San Diego, and it moved north through the mountains. This is east of San Diego between most of the cities, the L.A., San Diego area, and the deserts. Now, all of that water came down on the mountain area, also with high winds, causing some damage there, knocking down trees and damaging some of the roads. But the day after this morning, a lot of that water made its way into the desert communities. If you look at the geography in California, these mountains separate a lot of these urban areas from the desert. So we knew, officials knew that the flooding was a danger. We did have some of that flooding here in the San Diego area, but those areas had been identified. Those roads were closed down. We had a boulder come down on one of the major freeways here. Officials shut that down. But really right now, it's the desert areas. These are valleys that are completely flat where it's very difficult for large amounts of water to go anywhere. So that's why we're seeing these images today in places like Palm Springs. We're going to hear from one of the residents in Palm Springs dealing with the effects of this storm. How long will it take to get it cleaned up and people can be on the road to work again and home? A lot of people are uh, kind of laughing this off and thinking that it's not a big deal, but it, it is. And uh, it's going to affect people for a long, long time. 
Again, and today, officials all across Southern California warned residents to be careful with areas that still have flooding. This is water that's coming down from the mountains. And of course, we've had some of these mudslides still take place as we see these images coming out of Palm yeah. Springs, where they will have to wait for this water to recede before they can begin that cleanup effort. They're just not used to it. Guad Venegas, thank you very much. We mentioned the concern that the wind now, those gusts, could whip up those wildfires in Washington state. That's where we find Jesse Kirsch with more. This is incident command for the Gray Fire. Of the three fires that are burning outside of Spokane, Washington, officials say that this fire has destroyed the largest number of structures and has threatened the largest number of residents here in eastern Washington state. Hundreds of firefighters have been working around the clock to battle this blaze, which has so far not been put under control. In Spokane County alone, there are reports of upwards of 25,000 acres burning. Thousands of people have been ordered to evacuate, including the city of Medical Lake, where roughly 5,000 people were ordered to evacuate. And we know that there have been dozens of structures, including homes, which have been burned down in these fires so far. The air quality has been a concern here and across much of Washington state because of the wildfires in Washington, as well as wildfires in Canada. All of this unfolding as we've learned from officials that there's one confirmed death, someone who was found in the gray fire zone, another person confirmed to have been found dead in the Oregon Road fire zone. However, at this point, officials have not confirmed whether or not those deaths have been caused by the fire. So we'll be watching for an update there amid this devastation as firefighters again continue working to battle these blazes. Back to you. Our thanks to Jesse Kirsch for that reporting. Meteorologist Bill Karens is tracking all of it. And we do, Bill, mean all of it. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, we got the uh, what's left of Hillary. And then we got this incredible heat wave in the middle of the country. And, oh, yeah, a tropical storm is going to probably hit Texas tomorrow morning. And then Franklin may bother the East Coast in about seven days from now. Yeah, just a lot going on. So Hillary now is located heading up into Idaho. There's not, we're starting to drop a lot of these. Uh, the Vegas area has dropped out, so i got to drop my number here. Uh, but we still have a couple isolated areas with flash flooding as possible. I don't think it's going to be too widespread. Looking at the heat, this is just some numbers that have just been incredible, uh, like historically incredible, not to be in it incredible, uh, from Houston all the way up to Minneapolis. But the worst of it is from Oklahoma, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri. These are the current big city heat index. Feels like 112 in St. Louis, 116 in Kansas City. And that's almost cool compared to certain spots. If you're with us last hour, we've had a couple stations that look like they're broken. I mean, yeah. 143. Okay. So that's what one, we think, not yeah, right. Yeah, 143, 150, 133. So I've done some digging, and some of my meteorologist friends have been trying to help me figure out this mystery. The type of sensors that are used in these spots are notorious for failing at the high end of extreme values. So they are throwing these numbers out. But I do know, Sue City hit 122. They broke their all-time hottest heat index record in Sioux City. Uh, to the south, Omaha's at 114. Uh, St. Joseph is 119. Topeka's 123. And these all appear legit. Oof. Lawrence, Kansas, home of University of Kansas, 128. And right before I went on air, Miami, Oklahoma had 126. And now the Oklahoma Mesonet that keeps track of all the sensors, they said that's an official measurement. That's the hottest it's ever felt in the state of Oklahoma, 126. Once you get above, like, 120, Bill, it probably just academic, right? At that point, like, it, it is hot as hell no matter how you slice it at that point. Yeah, you're, you're, anyone working outside shouldn't be at that point. Yeah, heat stroke, yeah. all that stuff really becomes a big problem. And, and by the way, in case you're wondering what the heat index is, it's in the shade, temperature, dew point combined in equation. And if you go in the sun, you add about 15 degrees to those numbers mm. I just showed you. So that's only if you're in the shade, by the way. And then finally, we'll wrap this up. So I can probably talk for the whole hour. The tropical depression's trying to form here in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Tomorrow morning, this comes onshore somewhere near Brownsville, South Padre Island. It does not look like it has time to get strong enough to be a hurricane, likely a tropical storm. So windy conditions stay inside tomorrow morning. Uh, hopefully we won't lose too much power. We'll actually get some beneficial rain. You know how hot it's been in Texas all summer. I was thinking you know, if it's a rainy day and it's kind of safe and it's not too windy, they're going to be thrilled to get a rainy day and have it cooler mm. than you know how it's been. Bill Karens, uh, you got a lot to watch in the next few days, friend. I'm sure we'll talk again. Thank you.
want to take you now to Hawaii, where President Biden and the First Lady, you watched it live last hour here on this show, landed on Maui. And in literally just in the last couple of minutes, they've wrapped up a helicopter tour of the just devastation on that island, especially in the historic town of Lahaina, incinerated in those wildfires. You can see the podium now where President Biden, the lecturer, is expected to make remarks in the next maybe 30 minutes or so. That's a live look there. The latest numbers show at least 850 people are still believed to be missing. At least 114 people have been confirmed dead. Officials say it could take weeks to complete the search, to finish the search of the burn zone because it is so big. And there is just such a huge amount of work that still has to be done. I want to bring in Dana Griffin, who is on the ground for us on Maui. Um, it is a significant thing for President Biden and the First Lady to show up and to shine the presidential spotlight on the just nightmare that this island has faced. Not everybody is welcoming the president to town. Explain that. Yeah, Holly, some people feel the visit from the president and first lady may be a little too late. It's been nearly two weeks since the fires tore through Lahaina Town, which you can see behind me. We expect to see the president and the first lady met with Governor Green, his wife, and the mayor of Maui pass us hopefully on the way to that spot where, they, where he plans to give remarks momentarily. Some people felt like the government's response was a little slow and too much red tape. People of Hawaii have really banded together over these last several weeks to help each other heal, to provide meals, to provide shelter. We also know FEMA has been a major part in that too. They tell us that they've you know, provided 18, they've sheltered 1,800 people now in hotel rooms and they've all moved out of the shelters. But people who, who are, you know, not in favor of the president showing up have also voiced their concerns. Listen to what they told us. I just would encourage the president to come meet us, see us, see the pain, see the, the grief, feel it, embrace it. And the president will likely speak to some of those survivors. He's also going to meet with first responders here in Lahaina. Uh, people want to know what's the next step forward. What is recovery going to look like on Lahaina? The most important thing is getting people back into their homes. It's going to take a minute because people want that process to be respectful and to not rebuild too fast. Yeah. But they want to make sure the land stays with the people of Lahaina and that it's not taken up in a land grab. Several people have complained about investors calling them trying to buy up their land before the search is even complete, Hallie. Dana Griffin, live for us there on Maui. Dana will be looking, of course, to hear from the president a little bit later on. We think this hour, you can watch it live right here on NBC News Now. Thank you. In just the last couple of hours, we've learned just how much it's going to take to keep former President Trump out of jail on bond. With our team watching his attorneys, look, leaving court in Fort Fulton County, Georgia. The magic number, $200,000. That is what his bond has been set at, with the district attorney herself signing off on it. And there are some conditions that come with this. For example, he is not allowed to make threats against co-defendants or witnesses or victims or community and property of Fulton County. That includes anything the former president posts or reposts on social media, like, for example, on his Truth Social platform. NBC's Blaine Alexander is joining us now live from Atlanta. And Blaine, some of these things are things we have not seen for Mr. Trump's co-defendants in this case. In other words, the fact that Fonnie Willis, for example, signed off on this bond, that's unusual, uh, and it's something that only the former president had in his yeah. case. That's what really makes so much of this so interesting, Hallie, is that, yes, we're talking about only a three-page document, $200,000, but the specifics of what is in that consent bond agreement, that, yes, the no, the, the wording about uh, threats or intimidation, that's something that, for the other four consent bond agreements that we saw today, that wasn't included in a single one of them. Uh, on all of the other ones, uh, somebody else from the DA's office signed off on those. Fonnie Willis herself put her name and her signature on the one pertaining to former President Trump. So, certainly very interesting and it could possibly speak to the types of discussions that took place in this. You know, what was interesting today, Hallie, is that we saw attorneys not just for former President Trump, as you saw there earlier, but we saw attorneys as well for Ken Cheesebro. And we can suspect that we will likely see more of these meetings in the days to come as we wait for people to turn themselves in. Now, we've also just gotten word from the sheriff's office. They put out a statement kind of telling us what we can expect from their end in the coming days, specifically down at the Fulton County Jail, which is about 15 minutes 
away. And they said that when the former president turns himself in, there will be a hard lockdown of the area surrounding the Rice Street Jail, meaning no ingress or egress during that time. It's certainly something that we would expect when you talk about the movements of a former president, but to see it in writing again, in talking about the jail itself, remember, the sheriff had said that they believe that all 19 defendants are going to turn themselves in there. But again, more details and kind of another clue that that's likely where it's going to happen. Well, yeah, um, and I just think as we look ahead to Thursday and or Friday, Blaine, I know that you and our team had reported it would likely not happen, as you said, for former President Trump earlier than Thursday. Um, can you give us a sense? I mean, I hate to ask for like a vibe check, but a little bit. I mean, Atlanta's seen a lot. Fulton County is used to very high profile things happening, right? Um, but this is kind of a, a, a yeah. it is a significant moment. It is a moment that will in some form or fashion make history here. Oh, that jail has seen some of everybody. I'm talking about right. a, a rap artist, uh, one of whom is still there, that, that is very well known. Mm -hmm. um, athletes, professional football players, a lot of people have come in and out of the Rice Street Jail. Certainly nobody that rises to the level of a former president. So, yes, when you talk about all of the parties involved, the Secret Service is heavily going to be involved. That's not something that we've seen with Fulton County Jail before. And remember, this is a jail, again, that is under federal investigation right now. The conditions are terrible. The sheriff has long said, we need a new jail. We need some more money. People are making shanks out of the crumbling walls. So this is a place already that's, you know, been looked at and in the spotlight for a number of reasons, but certainly none like this in, in terms of the former president coming here, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, thank you very much. So that is the legal landscape for former President Trump. But tonight we're getting a new look at the political landscape in the key state of Iowa. And in just the last couple hours, we're getting a look at some numbers showing a big divide among Republicans over whether Mr. Trump should stay the leader of their party. Now, here's the thing. The headline, the top line, Mr. Trump is stomping his competition straight up. 23 points above his next closest competitor, Ron DeSantis. We haven't seen a lead like that since the year 2000, when George W. Bush led the first poll in Iowa that came out by 27 points. He went on to win. The first, of course, gold standard poll, we should say. But dig a little deeper, right? The numbers out tonight show about half of Iowa Republicans say they think the party needs a new leader, either someone with better behavior or people who think Donald Trump was good, but they need to consider some fresh blood. The lead in Iowa, however, for former President Trump probably only reinforces his decision to skip out on Wednesday night's debate. Maybe the next one after that, too. He said over on Truth Social he will not be doing the debates, plural. It doesn't mean he wants other candidates to have the spotlight, of course. NBC News is confirming tonight he has already taped an interview with Tucker Carlson, the former Fox host, with rumors that he's going to try to counter-program Wednesday's debate with some of that. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is following all of it for us from Des Moines. So there's... Um, a little bit for everybody, maybe, in this new poll, right. but a lot of it is good news for Donald Trump. Fair? Uh, absolutely fair. There's been a lot of good news for Donald Trump on the political front, not on the legal front so much, Hallie, but on the political front, his national polling numbers are dominant. We're talking anywhere from 30 percentage points to 50 percentage points. But when you look here at Iowa, just take into account the folks who said right now that Donald Trump is their top choice. Two-thirds of them said that they will surely be supporting him. They are firm. Their mind is made up. It is Donald Trump on January 15th at the Iowa caucus. You compare that to Ron DeSantis, just the, among the folks that said that he was their top choice, just one-third of them said he was firmly their decision. So for Donald Trump, you look at those numbers and you feel pretty good. At the same time, there are still a number of candidates that are being actively considered by Iowa Republicans, from Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Ron DeSantis, even Chris Christie here. So this is not over yet. We're still five months out, Hallie. That is for sure. Um, there's also, as we were talking about with Blaine, the indictments that the former president is facing, there's also some new clues as to the limits or not that he faces on campaigning off of those legal issues. Talk us through that. Right. If you look at some of the numbers here in this poll here, just here from the last hour, uh, one of the numbers, right, Donald Trump, rival Republicans were asked about whether they thought that he had committed serious crimes or not. Two-thirds of Iowa Republicans said that he did not. Uh, for Donald Trump here, he is finding a, a very sympathetic uh, group of voters here who believe that he has been uh, unfairly targeted as part of these four indictments. Take a listen, though, because there are Iowa Republicans, one third of them that say he did commit serious crimes, and they're looking for somebody that is not him to be their party's nominee. Take a listen to Dennis. 
Should Donald Trump continue to be the leader of the Republican Party? No. Um, I think we had a, a good chance to wash our hands of him in the uh, second impeachment trial. If he loses in 24, I, I, I don't know. It might be the last chance to be rid of him, but uh, I, I think it's, it's too firm a grip right now. And Howie, there's one other polling number here to Dennis's point, who Dennis wants somebody that's not Donald Trump at the same time. Uh, in that poll the, from NBC News here, uh, there were two days in which folks were asked about who they, their top choice was. And Donald Trump, among the folks who responded in those two days, said that uh, by an 18 percentage point margin, Donald Trump was ahead of Ron DeSantis. In the three days after the indictment, that number it grew to 25 percentage points, which again just speaks to Donald Trump's legal peril. It's somehow here making him a more sympathetic figure in this Republican vote, a, a Republican election, and one that Donald Trump is trying to use to his own political advantage uh, to knock out anybody that is attempting to take him on. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much for that. Live for us from Iowa. Appreciate it. Right now, state lawmakers in Tennessee, as we speak, are in the beginning of a special session called by the Republican governor to look at public safety, including gun safety, after that horrific school shooting at a Nashville elementary school in March. You are seeing here some live shots now of the state house in Tennessee. That shooting in Nashville left six people dead, including three little kids and two of the governor's friends. Since that shooting happened, you've seen groups in that state demonstrating, pushing the governor, asking him to do more, asking lawmakers to do more. It's all happening as a brand new analysis out today of CDC data shows that Gun injuries, things related to guns, that's the number one cause of death for kids and teens for the second year in a row. Not car crashes, not overdoses, not cancer, it's guns. Guns killed more than 4,700 children in 2021. That is a record. That is a grim record. The most of those deaths, about two-thirds, were homicides. Berkeley Loveless is covering this and is joining us now. Um, Berkeley, what explains this? What does the study say about the reasons behind this? Yeah, so this actually surprised the researchers. So they actually thought that gun sales or gun deaths would actually go down in 2021, not up. Um, and so during the pandemic, kids were at home, and so gun deaths rose sharply. Um, and the thinking was that gun deaths would actually go down the following year uh, as more people were going outside. Um, and so that didn't happen. And so they're currently blaming social or structural inequity, racism, social determinants of health, uh, food insecurity, uh, gun sales also went up during that time. Um, and so right now they're adv advocating for stricter gun laws and also for parents to store their guns in safer places in the house. You mentioned race. Race does have an impact in these numbers here. Walk us through that. Yeah, so uh, black children were more likely to die by homicides. In fact, two thirds of black male children were dying by homicides. Um, and then white children are more likely to die from self-inflicted gun injuries. Um, and so kids who also survive these things Things also have other things that they may have to deal with, such as mental health problems and substance abuse disorders. So this is to say that this is also like a public health issue as well as a, as well as a political one. Does this new analysis wade into potential solutions here, things that we can do? Uh, it does not. Yeah. Um, currently, it's just they're kind of going through the surprise. Um, I actually spoke with somebody. Uh, her name is uh, Dr. Uh, Emily Lieberman. She was the survivor of the Highland Park shooting. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's currently advocating uh, for more mental health services as well as stricter gun laws as well. Um, and she's still cur currently seeing um, many children dying from gun. gun. Yeah, guns yeah. in this country. Yeah. Berkeley Loveless, thank you very much thank for bringing you. us these new numbers uh, and what they mean. Appreciate it. Coming up, we'll have some breaking news just into us on what the FAA is planning to do about a bunch of close calls between planes on runways. Plus, parents-to-be will soon have another option to protect their kids from RSV. This new decision just in from the FDA in just a sec. To Southern California now, where we're learning more about the death of a clothing store owner who was shot and killed outside her store over a pride flag hanging at her boutique. Police say Lori Carlton was pronounced dead on scene. The suspect ran away at first, but was later shot and killed by police after a confrontation. Carlton was a mother of nine, described as a pillar in her community. One of her daughters calling her death a senseless act of violence. She says her mom's flag, the pride flag, had been taken down before, and she, in his words, in her words, always responded by putting up a bigger one. Celebrities like Jamie Lee Curtis and Kristen Davis also posting their support and calling for Carlton to be remembered as a hero. 
I want to bring in Maggie Vespa. And Maggie, part of what seems to have struck such a chord here is the bigger picture. This is coming as there has been a rise, a spike in anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric and attacks, right? Yeah, there has. And everybody who's speaking out about this, who you just talked about, including the celebrities who are kind of her clients and her customers, uh, are doing so and including that and a lot of them in their statements, including Bridesmaids director Paul Feig, uh, who talked about this and says, if you don't think that that rhetoric has an impact, you should think again. No one more aware of that than GLAD's president. We talked to her earlier. Take a listen. A symbol like a flag that is for us supposed to be love and acceptance has been weaponized and has been turned into something that now someone loses their life over. It's horrible. And so we want to be clear, Hallie, as you said, the shooter in this case has not been identified, the suspect in this case, and police have also not deemed this a hate crime, but they said basically witnesses told them that just before that shooter shot Lori Carlson, he was angry and he made several comments about her pride flag. So that's kind of how this link is being built at that time with those caveats noted. That being said, the rise in attacks, it is clear the numbers are jarring. One study shows 145 attacks this year against the LGBTQ community. That is more than three times times the rate of last year, Hallie. So just heartbreaking all around. And of course, yeah. this microcosm in California is just shattering that community. Maggie Vespa, thank you very much. Let's take it to Florida now, where health officials there are out with a new warning tonight. After five people died due to a rare flesh-eating bacterial infection in and around Tampa Bay, another 21 people have gotten sick from this thing since the start of the year. It's a naturally occurring bacteria. So this bacteria just exists in nature. You can get it by swimming in what's called brackish water. That's warmer water where the ocean or salt water meets fresh water. So think of a bay or think of like a sound, for example. It gets in, this bacteria, through open cuts, open sores, anything like an open wound that you have on your body. You can also get it from eating bad shellfish. It's deadly in about one in five people who get it. Floridians are used to seeing cases in the summer, but the number of people who died in such a short period is what is concerning so much to these local officials. If this all sounds familiar, we reported on this show just last week that three people died in and around New York from an illness caused by the same type of bacteria. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar is joining us now. What is the context check here? What is the level of concern that we should have about this? You know, Hallie, I think it's it's moderate to high. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of, of uh, you know, fallout and consequences from climate change. We talk about it a lot, and, and it's really not redundant. It's, it's very appropriate to discuss that here. Um, we see warmer water temperatures, which allows bacteria to flourish, and we've also seen more hurricanes. Take a look at these numbers from 2022. There were over 70 different, uh, 70 cases and 17 deaths, and that was during a time where there was a hurricane that hit that area, um, again, sort of, uh, you know, triggering this increase in cases because this is what bacteria, um, this is how they survive, Helly. What do people do, right, if they're interested? It's still, I know that summer is waning, kids are heading back to school, but if you're still enjoying, let's say, the last couple of weeks, or you're looking forward to Labor Day, going for a swim, whatever, what are you telling your patients to do? Well, here's the thing, right? I mean, we talked, you, you mentioned in the lead about the cases in Long Island, you know, the warmer mm -hmm. water temperatures are going to start hitting, you know, beach towns further north than, than Florida, um, you know, and, and the recommendations can be pretty straightforward. If you have, uh, you know, an open wound or you just recovered from surgery or you had a recent piercing or a tattoo, you've got to be really careful about going into either brackish or salt water. Um, you know, the symptoms to look out for, of course, would be a skin infection that can happen within 24 hours after exposure, but that very quickly will lead to an infected area of the wound, and pretty soon you can start having systemic symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cramping, fevers, chills, and that's when you know that you're really in the dangerous territory, Hallie. About one in five people who get sick with this Vibrio bacteria unfortunately die, um, so it is a medical emergency once this is diagnosed, Hallie. Clearly. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the FDA in just the last hour approving a vaccine for pregnant women so they can protect their babies from RSV. That's a 
pretty intense respiratory virus. This vaccine is from Pfizer. It works by essentially making sure that the pregnant moms are vaccinated so they can pass on antibodies. The company hopes this shot will be available sometime in the fall, like late October or early November. Pfizer's shot for older adults is already available. Number two, a federal judge in Denver is sentencing a dentist named Larry Rudolph, who killed his wife while on an African safari to life in prison. The judge is also ordering him to pay more than $15 million. Rudolph has said that his wife's death was an accident. His lawyers plan to appeal. Number three, a federal judge in Georgia is temporarily blocking part of a state law that restricts doctors from prescribing hormone therapy to transgender minors. The judge says the harm transgender people could face from the ban, like depression, anxiety, and self-harm, outweighs any harm to the state. But the part of the law that bans gender transition surgery for minors is going to stay in place. The judge says her ruling will stay in effect until essentially a trial or a further court order. Number four, Meta says it'll launch the web version of its Threads app soon. That's after everybody was all jazzed up about Threads. It was like, yes, let's get on Threads, let's do Threads. And then the user base really dropped. Threads, which is, again, like part of the Instagram family, the Meta family, it's trying to compete with X, formerly known as Twitter. According to the Wall Street Journal, the launch of the website, desktop, laptop version should be out later this week, potentially. Number five, have you heard this one before? My dog ate my passport. Just a few weeks before this Boston couple left for their wedding in Italy. There, that's the proof right there. They got the receipts. The dog chewed up some pages in their passport. They had gone out to get their marriage license when their puppers got a hold of their, of their documents. The groom told NBC Boston today he got an emergency appointment for a new one. We still don't know if he's going to get it. Good luck. That Italy wedding, tough to reschedule when we come back. A wildfire in a popular tourist spot in Spain, forcing thousands of people to get out fast. But police are now investigating. That's later in the global. Plus, a former neonatal nurse in the UK, convicted of murdering the baby she was supposed to care for, getting a rare sentence today. Why the judge says the case called for exceptional circumstances. Some breaking news just into us tonight. As we are learning, the FAA is ordering urgent runway safety meetings, these critical safety meetings at 90 airports. This is after a bunch of somewhat scary close calls on the runway. There have been 46 in the last month alone, according to a new analysis of preliminary FAA data by The New York Times. Remember this, for example? It's a screen grab from inside the cockpit of a JetBlue plane that came within seconds of hitting a different chartered plane, it was taking off that other plane without permission at Boston Logan. Also in Boston, there was this incident where two planes actually clipped wings. Oof, right on the tarmac. Our Tom Costello is with us. He is breaking this news tonight here exclusively and on NBC Nightly News. Walk us through it. What do we know? Bottom line is that the FAA is concerned enough about this rash of what they call runway incursions. Bottom line is, in layman speak, those are close calls, yeah. right? That they are now ordering, ordering that 90 airports nationwide immediately have a, a series of runway safety summits or meetings at the runways. These are some of the biggest airports in the country, but not all big airports. Reagan Airport is among them. Cleveland, mm. Baltimore is among them. Uh, there, there's a long, long list. Bottom line is your airport will be on it eventually. I talked to the NTSB chief earlier today about the rash of these uh, close calls on runways. Here's what she had to say. Any one of these, it could have led to catastrophic, devastating consequences. Anywhere between 300 lives or more at, were put at risk in these uh, near collisions. We have been very, very lucky in this country. We have not had a fatal accident, a U.S. airline fatal accident. I think it's in 14 years since yeah. the Colgan air crash in Buffalo, which was tragic. Uh, the bottom line is, are we getting complacent in the cockpit and the air traffic control towers? We don't have enough controllers right now, 1,200, not enough. So all of these factors may be reasons why the FAA now feels like we need to drill down on safety. They're basically saying, hey, get on notice to these airports saying this is these, these safety reviews we want you to conduct. What's the timeline for something like Immediate. that? Immediate. But I mean, like, when will we know any results from these, these uh, Well, reviews? let's just hope that things start to improve, right? Let's just hope that we no longer have any immediate reports of more incursions or close calls. Here's what they're going to do. They're going to tell every single airline, every pilot, every, every controller, you've got to double down on the basics. You've got you to really listen to each other on the radio, yeah. double confirm radio instructions. You've also got to go forward and have a sterile cockpit, as we've talked about before. That means in the cockpit, pilots can only talk about 
about the business of the plane and the flight. Talking about your kids, the football game, whatever, that waits until you're at 10,000 feet. Is there hope that doing these things, reiterating the fundamentals, if you will, could actually yeah. start to make a difference for these numbers of incursions that we're seeing? There is absolutely hope. And let's also keep in mind, the United States is right now in its safest period of aviation yeah, history true. in history. And it's because there is a multi-layer checkpoint already in the country at every airport, every air traffic control tower, every airline. Nobody wants a plane crash. It's in nobody's interest. But there is the map of some just some of the yeah. more recent high-profile incidents where it's gotten very close, too close for comfort with planes coming too close either on the ground or in the air. Tom Costello, great scoop, great reporting. Thank you so much, as always. A former neonatal nurse sentenced to life in prison in the U.K. today after a stunning crime that has gripped that nation. This nurse was convicted of killing seven babies and trying to kill six others she was supposed to be caring for. Here's what the judge said at Lucy Leppe's sentencing. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. During the course of this trial, you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have no remorse. We also heard from family members in court making statements off camera for their privacy. One mother who lost her child saying, and I'm quoting here, there is no sentence that will ever compare to the excruciating agony that we've suffered as a consequence of your actions. Josh Letterman is joining me now. And Josh, this is, um, the circumstances around this are so horrific. It has captured people in the UK to the point where even the prime minister is talking about this sentence, right? That's right. It's been hard for people here in the UK to even wrap their heads around uh, the immensity and severity of this crime, Hallie. It's now believed to be uh, the worst baby killer in the history of this country, or at least since there are records dating back that far. Uh, and so folks here have been really trying to understand what led Lucy Letby uh, to kill seven babies, attempts to kill at least six more. Uh, and I believe we have some breaking news, so I'll toss it back to you. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Live for us from London. Josh, I appreciate it. We're showing you now a live look at what's happening on the ground on the island of Maui, where President Biden and the First Lady have landed. They are visiting people there, looking at the absolute destruction after wildfires ripped through the historic town of Lahaina. We are expecting to see President Biden any second now step up to a microphone, make some remarks. He's been meeting with first responders, with other officials there on Maui. Uh, for f the president, this is a moment to put the spotlight of the White House and the federal resources of the government on a place that is struggling. Days after those wildfires left, 114 people confirmed dead. Something like 850 people are still believed to be missing. The search is mostly complete, but it could be weeks before the entire area has been searched, as you are, again, taking a live look at some of this damage. Uh, President Biden, of course, and the First Lady traveling from Nevada, where they had been spending some time, as you can see, the president now traveling with First Lady Jill Biden on their way to the, to the lectern, to the microphone where the president will speak. Uh, at a moment like this, we have seen President Biden in moments like this before, after terrible natural disasters, seeking to reassure people in Hawaii and around the country that the resources of the federal government will go towards helping this island rebuild. It is going to be a long rebuilding and recovery process, uh, one that will take years. As we reported earlier here on this show, not everybody on Maui is happy to see President Biden coming to town. It is a complicated moment for some of the locals uh, who are struggling with what has happened, who are struggling with this being such a moment of grief, horror, and terror for them, uh, still in some ways in shock and looking to see where this goes next, what happens next. At this moment, just this incredible image here of President Biden looking at this burned-out wreck of a car. We're going to hear the president first, and then, of course, the governor of Hawaii. You can see they're, they're touching what's left of some of this twisted metal, as we have our team of correspondents who are on the ground and who have been on Maui, of course. You see First Lady Jill Biden with him as well. We saw Air Force One land just about an hour ago. The president has seen the damage now from the air. He is seeing it up close and personal on the ground. And he's had a moment now to talk to some of the responders 
that have been there. We know that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is working to help people in Hawaii after being criticized for being somewhat slow to respond to this natural disaster. We want to go now to our NBC News special report. report. Here's Lester Holt. We are coming on the air with breaking news. President Biden has arrived in Hawaii and is set to speak at this podium in Maui any moment. You can see the president and the first lady now making their way through some of the burn scar area. The president just toured the damage from the deadliest wildfires in modern U.S. history. Uh, the president viewed the destruction from a helicopter also, as you saw a moment ago, on foot. And he is now uh, addressing reporters and, and gatherers there. Incredible courage. That's not hyperbole. All the nation, the American people stand with you. Governor Josh Green, you've been incredible from the day we've spoken on this. You've been way ahead of the curve. Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke, Brian Chance, our senator, Senator Maisie. By the way, Maisie, I told my granddaughter, whose name is Maisie as well, she said, that's why I like her. Anyway, <laughs> but her name is Maisie as well. And, uh, and Jill uh, uh, Takuda, Representative Ed Chase, and uh, Mayor Rick uh, Basson. Uh, Rick, uh, when we talked on the phone, I never, I, you look like you played uh, in defensive tackle for, uh, I don't know who, but some, somebody good. But at any rate, I want to thank you for your leadership and this unimaginable, during this unimaginable tra tragedy. To my left is the banyan tree. Beloved by this community for over 150 years. Here in the former capital of the kingdom, Hawaii, that has stood for generations as a sacred spot of exceptional significance. One of the people who took me under his wing when I first got to the Senate was Danny Noe. He used to talk about, used to talk about the kingdom of Hawaii. He was, came from Japan, but it was amazing to listen to him. Hawaii, that has stood for generations as a sacred spot of exceptional significance. One of the people who took me under his wing when I first got to the Senate was Danny Noe. He used to talk about, used to talk about the kingdom of Hawaii. He was, came from Japan, but it was amazing to listen to him. Today is burned, but it's still standing. The trees survive for a reason. I believe it's a powerful, a very powerful symbol of what we can and will do to get through this crisis. And for this, for as long as it takes, we're going to be with you. The whole country will be with you. You know, uh, we will uh, be respectful of the sacred grounds and the traditions that rebuild the way the people of Maui want to build, not the way others want to build. We're going to rebuild the way the people of Maui want to build. But, you know, it's going to be hard. America's deadly wildfire, the deadliest wildfire in over a century. And Jill and I have what's left of uh, Walk Front Street, was left of it. We've surveyed the damage from the air as well. The devastation is overwhelming. To date, 114 dead, hundreds of people unaccounted for. I remember when I got the call, my first wife and daughter, I was a young senator, and I got a call in Washington. I hadn't been sworn in yet. I wasn't old enough. And I was hiring staff in the Capitol at Teddy Kennedy's office. And I got a phone call saying from my fire department, a young first responder, kind of panicking. You got to come home. There's been an accident. I said, what happened? He said, your wife, she, she, she's dead. Come home. Come home. The tractor trailer had broadsided her and uh, uh, killed her in a car accident along with my little daughter. And uh, I remember all the way down from Washington home wondering what a lot of people here are wondering. What about my two boys? How are they? They were in the car. I never got a read on that. Were they going to be all right? They were badly injured. Were they going to make it? Had they made it? it wasn't until I walked into the emergency room that I saw that they were there. The difference between knowing somebody's gone and worrying whether they're available to come back are two different things. You know, and uh, I, uh, I remember what one of the people who helped me the most was Danny Inoue. He helped bring me back, so I know the feeling that as many of the people in this town, this community, that hollow feeling you have in your chest, like you're being sucked into a black hole, wondering, will I ever, will I ever get by this? You know, and it's one thing to know, but it's quite another thing to have to wait to wonder whether your family member is going to be okay. 
Imagine being a parent wondering whether a child is, where it is. I remember, as I said, you know, press reports of grandfathers crying for lost neighbors while trying to be strong for the ones who survived. Of a woman distributing clothing to survivors who says she didn't lose her home, but she lost her hometown. But I also want all of you to know the country grieves with you, stands with you, and will do everything possible to help you recover, rebuild, and respect culture and traditions when the rebuilding takes place. My administration has been in constant contact with the governor and congressional delegation and local leaders. As soon as I got the governor's request, I signed the master, uh, the major disaster declaration that mobilized the whole of government response, which means whatever you need, you're going to get. For example, the Coast Guard and Navy immediately supported maritime search and rescue operations, while the Army helped fire suppression. Here's what that's here's what we've been doing since. First, we focused on search and rescue, which is still going on. Right now, there are over 450 search and rescue experts working round the clock. Second, I've identified FEMA's Administrator Griswold to lean forward, as she always has done, to help survivors get immediate aid. FEMA's quickly provided 55,000 meals, 75,000 liters of water, 5,000 beds, 10,000 blankets, working to help remove the debris, repair roads, and restore power. Additionally, my Department of Homeland of Housing and Urban Development is working with the state to make sure survivors can move in, from emergency shelters into temporary housing to finally have a permanent place to call home as well. Small Business Administration is making low-interest federal disaster loans available to Hawaiian businesses, many of them we've seen here, burned to the ground, homeowners and renters, and nonprofits. If you need help, you can visit FEMA's Disaster Recovery Center at Maui College or go to disasterassistance.gov, disasterassistance.gov. Today, I'm appointing Bob Fenton. Who's here. Where are you, Bob? There he is. I'm appointing Bob Fenton as our chief federal response coordinator for Maui to lead our long-term recovery work. He's one of the nation's most experienced disaster response and recovery experts in America. And I'm, I'm directing him to make sure the community has everything, everything the federal government can offer to heal and to rebuild as fast as possible. And we're focused on what's next. That's rebuilding the long, long term, rebuilding for long term and doing it together to help get us back on our feet to rebuild the way we want to rebuild by making sure your voices are heard by respecting your traditions, by understanding the deep history and meaning of this sacred ground and establishing your community not to change it, its character, but reestablish it. We're also going to bring the capabilities to help you rebuild so your critical infrastructure is more resilient in the future. That all this matters. Let me close with this. From stories of grief, we've seen so many stories of hope and heroism, of the aloha spirit. Every emergency responder put their lives on the line for us, save others. Everyday heroes, neighbors, helping neighbors, Native Hawaiian leaders offering solace and strength. And this banyan tree, one called it a diamond in the rough of hope. Another referred to fire cannot reach its root, what he said. Fire cannot reach its roots. That's Maui. That's America. And so the people of Hawaii, we're with you for as long as it takes, I promise you. May God bless all those we've lost. May God find those who we haven't determined yet. And may God bless you all. May God protect our troops. Now I'm going to be happy to turn this over to the governor, Governor Green. President Biden making uh, brief remarks after touring the Thank burn you. zone in Miguel, meeting survivors and residents of the area, as well as local leaders, and getting an update on FEMA's work on the ground, what the government can offer that it has not already. Let's go to Miguel Almaguer on the ground. Miguel, uh, as you have been reporting over the many days, emotions are just running raw there right now. And there was some question about what kind of reception the president would get during this visit. 
There was, Lester. We spoke to many people who were uncomfortable with his visit. They were concerned that his uh, appearance here would close roads where supplies were being shuttled through, and others who simply felt that the federal government, FEMA in particular, wasn't doing enough to help the victims here who have lost so much. Of course, the government, the White House, will tell you they are doing all they can right now, extending millions and millions of dollars into this area. This is just the beginning of a long rebuilding process. The area where the president is, we spent some time in earlier in the week. We know about 85 percent of that area has been searched for victims. As the president mentioned, the death tolls at 114. That number is expected to climb. 850 people are still missing. Lester, the president has been there in that area for about 20 minutes, about two hours here in Maui. He is expected to meet with first responders. He's also expected to meet with victims who have lost their homes and are still missing loved ones, Lester. All right, Miguel, thank you. Let me bring in Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. Uh, Peter Miguel mentioned concerns about folks of the president, just his presence being disruptive at a critical time. What was in the decision making to go and to go now? Well, the decision, according to the White House, was one that was focused heavily on making sure it would not interfere with the recovery efforts, the efforts to still sift through the awful scenes there, the ash that the president himself saw firsthand today. It was only when they had uh, the governor of that state, Governor Green, saying that they were ready to host the president, that the White House ultimately made the decision to travel there. Lester, I was struck by one of the things we heard the president say in his remarks, and he said it more than one time. He said that the rebuilding process will be respectful to the sacred grounds and traditions, to the traditions and culture that have long existed in Hawaii, and that it will not be rebuilt in the vision of outsiders, but in the vision of those native Hawaiians and those who live here. That is an effort to speak directly to the sensitivities who some, uh, to some who fear that some outside money, those from the mainland, other sort of venture capital money might be directed that way to try to rebuild that as more of a tourist destination and less of a native land that welcomes tourists each year. So that was interesting to me as we heard from the president. The president obviously has sort of uh, cast himself as a, a man of empathy based on his personal experiences and being there face to face with the survivors as he will be doing over the course of the next couple hours really allows him to demonstrate that compassion for the community. And as he said again today, Lester, the U.S. federal response is one that will be there throughout. It will not be short term made in spite of the seven hundred dollars that's immediately been provided, it will be a federal response that he says will be there for years. Lester. All right, Peter Alexander, thank you. And that concludes this NBC News special report. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.